Hey there, welcome to Heel Toe Automotive's YouTube channel once again. This is Marcus DiSabella. I'm the owner of HeelToeAuto.com. And as you know, we do all kinds of videos on Hondas and Acuras, um, mostly out of our garage here, which we affectionately call the Heel Toe Garage. Well, today it's pretty rainy outside, so I won't be going out there to do anything fun. But we've got this 1987 Civic hatchback in the garage. And uh, one thing about these cars is they've got a really unique suspension system. They've got torsion bars in the front with struts, and in the back they've got a beam axle with kind of a funky linkage arrangement and a semi-independent rear end. These cars are getting more and more popular to modify these days, but a lot of folks that are familiar with Golden Era Hondas from the 90s are a little thrown off when it comes to the 86, 87 SIs, actually the whole 84, 87 generation of Civic chassis. So we're gonna show you underneath this car and give you a good look underneath, uh, a little bit more about the suspension layout, probably not a whole lot about modding because we're gonna put that in a future video. Come along, let's get this car up in the air and I'll show you what's going on underneath it. All right, the first thing I'd like to show you is underneath the hood. We got a really cool power plant, but we're not talking about that today. Today we're talking about suspension. So the suspension here, you can see the upper mount where there is a strut shaft that comes straight up through the bottom. Now the factory layout here is just a conventional upper mount, which is basically a rubber upper mount, and then there are two studs holding it down. Here we have actually kind of a vintage -y sort of part, which is our Medieval Pro camber caster plates. What these allow us to do is shift the position of the strut mount and that will actually change the alignment of the suspension. Farther in or out will give us more camber, farther back and forward will change the caster angle. On an 88 to 2000 Civic, you actually have a shock mount here, not a strut mount. Those cars have a double wishbone suspension, so there's a control arm up here that will control uh, when you move in and out the camber angle. On these cars, it's a strut. And when I get down in the fender, I'll show you the difference between a shock and a strut. But you can see here that on this upper mount, there are no other mounting places for the control arm to go because there is no upper control arm in these cars. That kind of rounds out what I wanted to tell you underneath the hood. The upper mount situation here is a strut, which is probably more similar to like an EP, like 0205 Civic or newer Civic from that FA5 or anything with a strut in it as opposed to a shock. As we move to the back, you're gonna to have to forgive me, there's a lot of spare parts back here for this car as we are doing many projects with it. But I did wanna highlight the rear mount in the top and the back. This is it. This shock shaft right here, or I guess it's a strut shaft, is the only thing mounting the rear suspension in place on the chassis of the car in the top. So this is the top damper mount and you've got the upper mount here, which is in a rubber bushing, and that is actually conformed into basically the upper mount that is built into the chassis. So there is no separate upper mount that goes on top of the shock assembly in the back. It's all basically just built into the chassis. I'll show you more underneath. We've got the car about halfway up, and you can see a difference from what you might notice in an EF or an EG Civic already, which is we got a damper shaft here, but no spring. This is the first thing that usually weirds people out about these cars is, where is the spring? Now, if you go back to the back, you'll notice that you can't really see anything, right? There, there is no shocker spring to be seen here as well. But when you get underneath the car, that's where the differences are coming about. We got the car full up in the air and I actually have removed those classic phone dial wheels so that we can take a little bit closer look at what's going on with the suspension. All right, so you can see here, as I mentioned, this was a strut, um, much like you would find in a ninth generation or newer Accord or anything 01 and up for a Civic or an RSX. The damper mounts to the steering knuckle and it goes up into the upper mount. And the upper mount is actually normally mounted below uh, the shock tower here, the strut tower, but because we have those special camber caster plates, it's all mounted on top. But normally you'd see the factory mount mounted below, and of course you've got your damper 
Um, they usually have quite a large shaft, and that is because this is a strut, and it actually is a structural member of the car. If we remove this strut, you could see that the steering knuckle would have nothing locating it on the top. Uh, because of that, uh, struts usually have a much larger shaft to handle all the side loading that will happen as you're driving the car. As we mentioned before, there is no coil spring. Instead of a coil spring, we have a torsion bar. Now, the torsion bar is actually in this tube, which is called a torsion tube. So you've got a bar inside this tube, and what causes the springing action is the control arm, where the torsion bar is mounted to in the front. Let me pull this cap off so you can see it. Yeah, there's the end of the torsion bar there, right? These splines bite into the lower control arm. So when the lower control arm moves, it actually will twist this bar that's inside here, right? And it's actually anchored here at the back as well. And so because the bar will have this twisting motion, that twisting of the steel is what causes the springing action of this suspension. So when you're going to upgrade this suspension, obviously you're going to put higher performing dampers in there, and it's often that you will put a larger diameter torsion bar in here as well. Obviously, a thicker piece of steel that you're trying to twist, it's going to be harder to twist, and that gives you more of a high spring rate than you would normally have with a stock torsion bar. All right, in the back here, we can see we've got kind of a unique arrangement here as well. So we don't have the traditional sort of independent suspension that you would see on a newer Honda of any kind. We've got this beam axle back here, right? And the wheels mount to either side, and these dampers actually mount to the axle as well. So when the car goes over bumps, the whole axle goes up and down, right? And actuates the damper and spring. Now, these springs are ground control set up, and uh, because of that, we've got this threaded mount here. Normally, the springs on these cars would mount here at the bottom and then fit up into this seat here. There's a rubber spring seat actually built into the chassis, and that serves as the upper spring mount. When you convert to ground controls, though, they kind of have this inverted threaded mount that sits up in there, and that allows us to adjust the height of the car. Now, what controls the position of this axle? Obviously, there are dampers here located in the back, but there's also a trailing arm that goes to the front. See, the trailing arm we're fairly familiar with on the newer cars as mounting to the chassis in the front and then having a pivot bushing, and then you mount the hub carrier to the end of it. Well, this is pretty similar. It's just that instead of having a control arm that mounts to the knuckle out here, it's all part of the axle. So the axle kind of actuates on these two trailing arms. There's another link here that actually ties everything together, and that's this link right here, which is called a panhard bar. It's a normal suspension member that is used on axle layouts. Panhard bars are a fairly common occurrence in cars with solid axles in the back, and what they do is they control the right and left location of the axle. So when the car goes over bumps, the axle isn't able to wobble around. This panhard bar keeps it centered underneath the car. Now, when we talk about modifying the rear suspension, we've got a few moving pieces in place. Obviously, we're going to want shorter or higher performance dampers in the back and shorter springs, something like this ground control arrangement that has a threaded body, or we have a kit that we make with Tane that is a threaded shock and actually uses this spring seat at the top of the spring seat adapter in one of the Tane springs. That'll lower the car, but the other thing that happens when you lower the car is, as the suspension moves upward, this panhard bar is going to push everything to the right. Uh, as you can see, when this bar moves up, you know, it's going to want to push things to the right, just if you can think about that geometrically. So a common thing to do with these cars is you have to center the axle back underneath the car after you lower it, and that's why we have adjustable panhard bars. In an adjustable panhard bar, you can make it shorter so that when you lower the car, the axle can be pulled back under the center of the vehicle again. Okay, now, once you get underneath the car, you find that it's really not all that complicated, although it is fairly foreign to you. If all you've ever dealt with was 88 up, uh, 88 and newer Civics and Integras, 
then you probably wouldn't be familiar with some of this stuff that I just showed you. And that's perfectly normal. So if you have any questions about the way this suspension works at all or how you modify it, I want you to leave a comment below. Leave any question at all. If you're familiar with these, if I'm missing something, or if you have any strange questions about how to modify it, I'm more than happy to answer any question you leave me down below. But now that we're talking about the suspension, and we're not necessarily talking about modifying it in detail, I do have to go over one more important thing, which is the sway bars. So come on back underneath the car. I'll show you how the sway bars are laid out and what commonly is done to upgrade those as well. Okay, sway bars are not a super complicated thing. And here you can see there is a factory sway bar and this linkage arrangement probably looks fairly familiar to your golden era Honda people. It's got a series of bushings that sandwich themselves together between the sway bar and the control arm. That sway bar, if you know, is actually designed to keep the control arms level so that when you go over a bump with one side, it helps keep the other side up and that gives you a lot more stability in your cornering. So this bar goes all the way to the other side of the car and it's mounted with these bushings that mount to the chassis. This particular bar is, I wanna say 15 millimeters, something like that, and it goes over the subframe all the way to the other side over here. Now, because of the way that it snakes over the subframe and there isn't a whole lot of room in there, when people upgrade these sway bars, they usually don't replace this with the bigger one. If you get one from an Integra, it should be larger, like 19 millimeters, I wanna say, and that's a really nice upgrade to do on a Civic. But if you have already that size of a bar on a Civic, or if you have an Integra and you wanna upgrade the sway bar, the thing to do is buy another sway bar that actually mounts to the bottom of the subframe and utilizes the bottom end of this, adjust of this link here. So really, when you're upgrading the front sway bar on these cars, most often, you're adding a supplementary bar to it. Uh, the ADCO bar mounts to the back here somewhere uh, with a weird set of brackets and actually attaches here. Um, for this CRX, we got that car with a pair of KMAC sway bars that actually mount to the front tow hooks and then those bars come back and mount here too. So there's all kinds of interesting front sway bar arrangements that exist for these things, um, but they all involve adding a supplementary sway bar on top of the sway bar that's already in the car. Now in the back, we don't see anything sway bar at all. We just have this axle. And because it's an axle, you start to wonder, is there even value in putting a sway bar back here? Is this an independent rear end? Well, what we do find with these cars under high cornering loads is that as you put too much load on one side, say if you're doing a left-hand turn and you're loading up the right-hand side, that inside wheel is gonna to wanna to pick up and you do lose a little grip in the back that way. That can be good for rotation, but what you find is people will put sway bars on here in high performance applications to try to keep this rear axle as stable and level as they can um, as they're going through cornering. How do they do that? Well, they utilize this bracket mount here um, with a sway bar bracket that actually has a long link to it and then they just use U-bolt clamps onto the axle here uh, to actually add a sway bar. And you can see that there was a sway bar on here at one point. There used to be a U-bolt clamp on here that linkage would mount to and add a sway bar to the rear end. Now there's one other weird thing about the rear suspension on these cars is that even though that this is an axle, it is not a solid axle. It's hollow, it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise, but what might be kind of surprising is that there's actually a sway bar inside this axle. The way that this is designed to work is this hub carrier bolts directly to the end of the axle here. Like these studs go right through to the wheel bearing mount and then the wheel just bolts right on. Over here, it's a little bit different. You've got an arrangement where there's an additional linkage. Um, let's see, yeah, this additional linkage right here and it pivots against the control arm. And what happens is it allows the rear knuckle here to rotate a little bit relative to the axle. And it's kept in place in, with a sway bar that actually goes through the end of the mount here. So there's like a little bit of a springing ap action that happens on this side. Um, utilizing an internal sway bar. Mugen had a really big catalog of parts for this car and in addition to having different springs and torsion bars for the front, they had an upgraded sway bar that would go inside here as a larger diameter. Now you don't get a whole lot of 
difference in movement between the right and the left. And in a future video, I think I might try to show more specifically how this works. But ultimately, the most, most important thing to realize is that you have a semi-independent rear suspension here, as Honda had called it from day one, and that utilizes this internal sway bar and a little bit of movement right to left. And that actually added an ability for the car to have more grip and turns, because if they didn't, it would probably be really oversteery. All right, so now we've talked about the dampers and springs in the front and the back and how they mount, sway bars, and how those are situated in the car. The goal of this video is to give you a really good high-level view of how the suspension in this car works, um, and I think I've done that. Yeah, like I said, if you have any other questions, feel free to ask them below. I do have a couple of different suspension options for this car for upgrading, though, and I do want to run you through those in an upcoming video. So I want you to make sure that you subscribe and follow this channel and uh, make sure that if you're interested in these old cars, you come right to heel toe because as far as aftermarket stores go, we're probably one of the ones that specialize in them more than you'll find anywhere else. So thank you very much for watching and I really hope you enjoy this video. Have a great day.